standing firm on the solid foundation. I'll stay in the old time chapter tonight, James chapter 5, the key theme of our study in James has been spiritual maturity. Uh, I don't know if you've grown, I have, uh, but I try to grow, and uh, I've gained a lot out of this book. It's a good, good book. It's very meaty, and there's a lot in it for the Christian, and uh, basically for the Christian. Helps us to mature, tells us like it is, the way we're supposed to be. Uh, in chapter one, they were to be patient in our testings, in our test that comes in each one of our lives. Chapter 2, uh, a mature Christian practices the truth. Chapter 3, a mature Christian bridles their tongue. And uh, chapter 4, we learn that a true Christian is a peacemaker and not a troublemaker. And we learned how to draw closer to God and how to worship and be closer to the Lord. Now we come to the last mark of spiritual maturity. Uh, a mature Christian in this chapter we'll find out is prayerful and troubled. Prayerful and troubles. Uh, we all experience trouble in our lives. We all go through times of turmoil. And uh, James is centers in on, on uh, actually three different kinds of trouble he's going to be talking about, but we'll cover uh, big issues. Uh, Actually, he talks about four of them. The first one that he's going to talk about will be from in verses 1 through 9, and that's economical troubles. Uh, economic and money matters are very important in maturity in a Christian life. Would you agree with that? They surely are. And uh, we're going to find out that James uh, was dealing with a, a problem in the church or churches uh, with some, some rich people. We may not have that problem in our church. <laughs> but uh, uh, then in verses 10 through 16, James deals with physical troubles. And I think there's not anyone here tonight that cannot uh, realize that, that we are, our bodies are feeble. And as we get older, they get more feeble. <laughs> Amen? So, but we all have to deal with physical ailments 
And uh, so James is going to uh, appoint us in on that. Then uh, two verses, 17 and 18, uh, James will deal with national troubles. And uh, we could probably spend the rest of next year on our national troubles, but we won't. Then the last two verses, James will be dealing with church troubles. And uh, I, I, I am thankful that we in a church, that we are in a church where we don't have too many troubles in our church. If we do, I don't see them anyway. And uh, generally, if there's troubles in a church, everybody knows it. Everybody. So that's what uh, we're going to be looking at. One of the most searching and piercing sections of this whole letter, uh, James now launches in. Uh, in the very beginning, it's a rebuke. Uh, of the sins of the rich, so that's where we're going to that's where we're going to start focusing. Uh, after hearing a sermon on Psalms fifty two, verse three and four, which the sermon was entitled "Lies and Deceit," uh, a man wrote the IRS. I can't sleep knowing that I have cheated on my income tax. Encloses a check for $150. If I still can't sleep, I'll send the rest. <laughs> Let's look at the first six verses here in chapter 5. It's talking about the rich oppressors rebuked here by James. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rest of them shall be a witness against you. And shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of the Seboeth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth. And have been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. So, right off the bat, uh, James is talking about these rich men, and their riches, he says, were sinful. They were using their wealth for selfish means selfish purposes, and also were persecuting the poor in the, in the process of doing so. Uh, one of the themes that runs through James chapter 5 is, is the trouble that was going on. Uh, can you imagine in, in these days, they didn't, uh, they didn't get a monthly paycheck they didn't get a weekly paycheck. When the workers went to the field, they worked all day, and at night they were paid. And what was happening was they were hiring these, these people to come and work in the fields, and they would work them, and then at nighttime they wouldn't pay them. So the people were crying out to, to the Lord. These, these were... These were uh, uh, people, church people. Now, <clears throat> I don't know if I had cried to the Lord, I'd probably got a little more drastic than that. I'd probably uh, got four or five and we'd have went and seen somebody. But uh, that's what was happening. Uh, 
We'll see poor people were deprived of their wages in verse 4. People who are physic, they were being physically afflicted uh, in verses 13 through 16 and spiritually backslidden at the end of the chapter. The second theme that James uh, introduced in chapter 5 is prayer. Uh, the poor laborers cry out to God in verse 4. They cried out to the Lord of the host, the Lord of the, that, that word there, Sebaoth, means uh, Lord of the armies or the Israel armies. And so they were crying out to, they, they wanted, <laughs> they actually, if the context of, of that word there, they wanted God to come and, and uh, punish these guys that were doing this. So, James cites at the end of the chapter in verse 17, I think, and 18, he cites Elijah uh, as an example of one uh, who believed in prayer as an, as an example. When you join these two things, we will arrive at our fifth maturity mark, and that is of a mature Christian, we are to be prayerful in our troubles. And uh, I think sometimes we have troubles come upon us and maybe that's the last thing that we do is pray, which it should really be the first thing that we do. Uh, the key, instead of giving up when troubles come, the mature believer turns to God in prayer and he seeks divine help from, uh, from the person uh, that we're supposed to be seeking, the one that does own the cattle on a thousand hills. The clarification here, James did not say it was a sin to be rich. He's not saying that. It's not a sin to be rich. But uh, it is a sin if you or taking that money and by abusing somebody else to get it. Uh, can anybody name of somebody that was rich in the Bible? Abraham. Very rich, wasn't he? Uh, and uh, Abraham had uh, lots of livestock and, and servants and uh, he had a nephew that was also rich. Remember him? And, uh, but he didn't do so well with his. He wasted his and took it to a... And got it to... Not, not, he wasn't a, the same character as Abraham was. So, it's not, it's not a sin to be rich. Uh... James was concerned about the selfishness of the rich and advised them to weep and to howl in chapter or verse 1 there. James gives three reasons for his exhortation to these rich men. The first one we look at here, uh, the way they got their wealth. Uh, we're going to look at the way they got their wealth in verse 4. Uh, Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud. They were fraudulently taking the work without paying the help. And because of that, these people were crying out. The Bible does not discourage the acquiring of wealth. The Jews in Canaan owned their own property. They worked it. They benefited from it, just as we do. We go out, we work hard, uh, so we can have shelter, so we can have food, and so that we can have transportation. Uh, I was going to share with you, uh, I told you last week about the website, uh, told you about Forbes magazine and it was telling about the richest people 
Uh, Bill Gates is the richest man this past year. Uh, fourth year in a row. 18 out of the last 23 years, he has his title. His fortune is $86 billion. He was up $11 billion this year. Wow. Warren Buffett came in second. He only added $14.8 billion this year. Jeff Bezos of Amazon filled the number three spot with $72.8 billion. This year, he had the best of everyone. He gained $27.6 billion. That's a lot of money. Now, I look back here at verse 1. Go to now, ye rich men. Most of us, when we read that, uh, we think that James is talking about people like Bill Gates, people like... Warren Buffett. Uh, but maybe we ought to consider maybe not them. Maybe even closer to home. Have you ever considered your wealth? How wealthy you are? You say, brother, I'm about as poor as poor can get. I know. Uh, my mom and daddy, we grew up poor. We really did. Uh, Dad gave us boys. We had one gun. My oldest brother got to shoot it, and I was a dog. I'd go in the brush and scare out the rabbit, and he'd shoot the rabbit. And that's how, seriously, I mean, that's how we grew up. And a lot of you did, too. And I sure was glad when I got another brother, and I moved up. It's great to get out from being the dog. <laughs> but uh, there's a, check this out. The, the website I, I found this on was globalrichlist.com. Globalrichlist.com. On this site, you put in your annual net income. And I did this. And uh, it turns out that I am seven million two hundred sixteen thousand seven hundred twenty-fourth richest person in the world. That don't sound so bad, really. Seven million two hundred sixteen thousand seven hundred twenty-four richest person in the world. <laughs> But you know what? I fall into 1%. And I don't have that. I don't even work. <laughs> but yet I'm, I'm, I'm the richest 1% in the world. Can you imagine that? That means there's 99% of the world poorer than I am. There are 7.5 billion people in this world. And half of them make less than $2 a day. $2 a day. Then we had to come back and we read this scripture again. And I have to figure out, you know what? I may be one of these that he was talking about. Not that I was doing anything to hurt somebody else. But uh, I don't think we have to go so much as to look at the Bill Gates in this context here. If God judges all men equally, and he is no respect of persons, then we are among the rich of this world. Would you not agree to that? If you, how many have ever been to a third world country? Then you know what I'm talking about. Uh... uh It's a, if you've never been to a third world country, it's just really hard to explain how, how, how much you really, really have compared to some people in this world. And uh, 
It'll make you very humble. It really will. Uh, James does not condemn the rich for simply because they are rich. His strong warnings are based upon what they did with their riches. And I think, you know, when God blesses us, as he does, what we do with that, that God blesses us with, is very important to God. And uh, what would you say would be something that God would, would really want us to do with the blessings that he gives us? Huh? What? Tithing? Yeah. Why? Does God need it? Then why do we need to tithe? Huh? Okay. So we can sit in padded pews. Right? <laughs> no. What about... How, do, how does our missionaries get to the field? Huh? Huh? We send them, don't we? Yeah. If you'll go back there in the foyer, you'll see all the our missionaries are there. We're on the back of our, our bulletin every Sunday. You'll see all of our missionaries listed there. What country they're in. And if you'll count down there, you'll see we, ha we support 50 missionaries. And uh, they have to... They, a missionary cannot go to a foreign field and have a job. They will not allow you to because you, unlike America, would be taking the job of one of their people. And they, that's a no-no. Now, it's not that way so much here. But you can't go and work. You have to, before you can even get on most foreign fields, you have to show proof that you have an income and you don't need to work in their, their country. And, uh, or you can't, you cannot you cannot be there if you can't if you're not self-supported. So our missionaries, I'm going to spend a little bit of time here on missions. Our missionaries are dependent upon what we do at our churches and uh, the projects that they do. The uh, just like we read today, uh, Brother Eber, they're getting ready to to do a new move and that that has to be he he'll have to raise money for all this stuff uh when you go to the foreign field what's the first thing that you would do if you were a missionary getting off the airplane you've never been there you get off the airplane what do you what do you think you have to do first you gotta you the first thing you better be finding out is where Especially if it's in the rainy season, you're gonna, you're not, they're not gonna let you to camp out at the airport. Most of those airports you wouldn't want to camp out at anyway. But you got to find a place to stay, and uh, that takes money. There's one other thing that you have to do. What's that? You got to find a way to get to a house or get to a place. And I don't know, I know in the capital of Zambia, Lusaka, when you land in the airport, it will cost you, what is it, $50 to get from the airport to town. And uh, so, and when, in 1989, the taxi I took from the airport to town, uh, there was two ropes. I was sitting in the back seat. There was two ropes on both doors. And uh, I didn't think nothing about it till we started taking off. And those doors were going like this. And he says, hold the ropes. Hold the ropes. So I had to hold the door shut. And, <laughs> but that, you know, missionaries are dependent upon are giving to missions and we we give by faith promise and it works out very well so uh, 
it goes right along with, with what God gives us and we share with our missionaries. Uh, we further the gospel. It's because we have the heart that God has put in us to, to share so others might hear the gospel. And that's why the Ebers are in the Philippines, why they've been there faithful all this year. And, and he talked about the salvation and the training of young men and women to go out and do that. They are supported by several churches. When I, when I went to the mission field, I think I had 113 churches that supported me. And that, that was quite a few churches back then. But uh, uh, it, was, it was such a blessing uh, to have faithful churches that never missed and always gave. We're going to pick this back up next week. I'll stay in the